welcome to WooStream, where we're bringing the Willamette community together. I'm Eric Lassan, and for today's conversation, we are joined by Karen Wood. Karen became Willamette University's chaplain and associate professor of religious studies in 2012, following 10 years as associate chaplain for vocational exploration and director of the Lilly Project for theological, ethical, and spiritual exploration of vocation. Karen earned her THD from Harvard, and her doctoral thesis explored the role of liberal Jewish voices in the construction of Christian theologies of Judaism. Her work with public benefit and educational institutions has included directing programs in interreligious dialogue in national and international settings, serving as dean of students at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, and at the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland. Karen is a minister of the United Church of Christ and an avid backpacker and an enthusiastic transplant from the East Coast to the Pacific Northwest, as am I. Today, we'll talk about Karen's dual role as a Willamette chaplain and associate professor. We'll also cover topics including Willamette's outreach in this time of crisis, the value of a Willamette education, and ways that we can all stay connected until we can once again return to campus. How are you today, Karen? I'm well, Eric. Thanks. Happy to be here. Oh, it's really great to have you on WooStream, and I'm excited for our conversation. So um, tell us a little bit about the East Coast to West Coast transplant. It sounds like you used to be a New Yorker. I was a New Yorker. I was in New York for um, 10 years to the day before I came to Portland. Um, prior to that, um, I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, but we were always told that some, we were in diaspora and someday we would be returning to the promised land, which was somewhere east of the Hudson and north of the Mason-Dixon line. So uh, I ended up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island for college and then in uh, Boston for graduate school and moved from there to New York um, to work in interreligious dialogue uh, positions and to work at Union Theological Seminary. So the East Coast to West Coast migration was slow. Um, I fell in love with somebody who lived in Portland and we did, uh, <laughs> this was before, this was rough. This was before Skype. This was, um, so we did the on the plane um, once a month uh, thing, commute back and forth. And uh, after about three years, I figured I could give up New York and I'm really glad it went that way. I think um, if I had grown up in Oregon, I might never have left. So it's so beautiful here. Um, there are things I miss about New York and the East Coast. Um, sarcasm doesn't work very well here. People just think you're being mean, so I'm kind of over that. I still haven't figured out the dress code after t more than 20 years, but in all other ways, I'm a very happy Oregonian. Excellent, excellent. And, and a THD from Harvard, that's, that seems really impressive. And so that would be a theological doctorate or a doctor of theology? Yeah, a doctor of theology. It, um, they don't even give that degree anymore. Boy, that oh, makes wow. me feel. Um, <laughs> it's, it's mostly a European degree now. Um, it, uh, it's like a PhD in all ways, except that it requires a higher level of entry. So you need a three-year master's. Um, oh, wow. And uh, it's a little more specialized. So, um, and it was, it was um, it's awarded, it was, they no longer do it. It was awarded by the Divinity School at Harvard. Okay. Um, and they've all converted those to, to PhDs. There are no THDs anymore coming out of Harvard. So. Okay. Okay. Well, and does this mean that we can call you the Reverend Dr. Wood? Uh, you could, but nobody would know who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> we all know yeah, love you as Karen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, put the, put the, if you don't mind putting the professor hat on for a couple minutes, um, tell us about the courses that you teach at Willamette. Oh, I get to teach great courses at Willamette. The one I teach every semester is um, Convocation, which folks might know is an event that happens on Thursdays from 1130 to 1230 in Cone Chapel. Um, it is the last remnant of what was once required chapel back in the 1950s. And there's a whole story about how that ended. Um, but then <laughs> it converted, if you will, to... Um, required convocation, which is not a worship service, but a gathering of folks for the purpose of exploring ideas. Because it has that history, we still have it in the chapel, or now we have it online. Um, and uh, for many years, the chaplain's office was in charge of putting together this program for the entire campus once a week, 
my predecessor, Charlie Wallace, in a moment of um, uh, great um, wisdom and uh, kindness, said, hey, students aren't coming to this. Maybe if students make it, they will come. And so it's a half credit class uh, that I get to teach. Um, mostly it's for sophomores, juniors, seniors, because if you're a first year student, it's hard to know how the institution works and you really need to know a little bit about the institution. So I had these grandiose ideas about what it is. It's like, oh, we, we create um, occasions for ethical or beautiful conversation or challenging conversation. Um, and then once I overheard one student say to another student, so how would you describe this class? And they said, oh, it's event planning. <laughs> so that knocked me down a few pegs. Um, absolutely right. It's absolutely right. It's event planning. Um, and so you learn how to conceive of, um, put together, plan, execute, and evaluate events um, mm -hmm. for the campus community and beyond. So that's convocation every semester. But those conversations do tend to be pretty interesting and engaging if I think about some of the topics I've seen and some of the ones I've dropped in on. Yeah, they are. It's always interesting. The warning I give to students who come in all enthusiastic is that you can never predict who's going to show up at convocation. Mm -hmm. right? And so, um, but I, except for the few that I set up at the beginning of the semester just to have like a, a long ramp up um, mm -hmm. because it's complicated to put one of these things together. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's up to the students to propose the topics and to, um, to choose them from amongst the class. So um, it's interesting what gets selected and it's interesting mm -hmm. what attracts folks. So um, the first one this semester was on uh, testing for STIs. Mm -hmm. And so we had two folks from uh, Marion County or Marion, um, yeah, Marion County Health um, Department in with a slideshow and um, uh, materials and goodies. And I warned them ahead of time, you're going to be doing this in a chapel. It might be the first time <laughs> we're talking about sexually transmitted infections inside what looks like a really churchy church. Um, mm -hmm. And they were terrific. And that got a pretty, it was uh, sort of a warm up to the mobile testing van showing up for mm -hmm. Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. So um, that got a good turnout. Often controversial topics will get a good turnout. Uh, masculinity and what that looks like and, and uh, how we, we um, think about it often gets a big crowd. That's a perennial. Um, things you might think would be really attractive, like mm, de-stress combo. Mm -hmm. ever gets many people at it. Interesting. So the class and a few folks will sit around and do coloring pages and do Zumba and eat cookies and drink tea and it, it works out fine. But it, if, if something's a very, very hot topic, you can be sure that a lot of folks will come. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen times when the chapel's filled on some of the topics. Yeah. And, and you and I have had some conversations uh, about potentially live streaming some of the convos on, on Whoopstream even. So I'm excited right. about that possibility right. down the road. Yeah, so changing that to um, online has been interesting. We've had one mm. uh, week of that, and we'll try it again this week. Well, we're not trying it. We're doing it, right? <laughs> That's um, going to happen. <laughs> Right, it will happen. Um, so, so convocation's great. And if students are ever sort of shy about wanting to take convocation, I always let them know that half the students in the class um, have never been to a convocation. So, um, yes, it is open to beginners in all kinds of ways. And some folks take the class because they want an excuse to go to convocation. Mm -hmm. And um, this is how they, they find that um, permission for themselves to- It's built to into their things. schedule. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely have to do it, so. Um, other courses you teach? Other courses um, are in the religious studies department for the most part. Um, I teach a upper level seminar on uh, um, liberation theologies and social change. And so we just did that last spring and it was um, huge fun. I am learning a lot from my students, and um, we we're learning a lot together. This is the form of theology that that um, sort of transformed my own thinking, and was rising to prominence in the time that I was going through graduate school, undergrad and graduate okay. school. So, it was really formational for me, and it is often a 
no pun intended, revelation for <laughs> students who have experienced um, limited forms of, of Christian thought and theology. And so the notion that um, there are whole swaths of and movements within Christianity that have been used to promote progressive social change on the basis of the Gospels and on the basis of the, the teachings um, is often news. So um, it's very fun to, to teach that class. Um, I teach another course um, called Christian Encounters with the Other, which looks at the history of um, the Christian church's um, texts, teachings, doctrine, and changing attitudes towards uh, women, towards Jews, and towards um, LGBTQ plus folks. And so some of that's um, not so much fun, reading um, the, the texts which have been used to oppress those particular groups and um, a little more um, encouraging as we move through those, those texts and look at the ways in which attitudes within um, large segments of the Christian community have changed um, mm -hmm. in response to, to more thoughtful um, appropriation, more thoughtful engagement with those texts and those doctrines. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the other class that I teach and hope to teach again next spring, but we'll see, um, is um, it's an interdisciplinary studies class, but it's, um, it counts as religious studies, um, is called um, The Inner Life of Activism. And Wendy Peterson oh, wow. and I put this together along with uh, two students, Clara Sims, who's now an alum, and Benjamin Smith, who's in his senior year, sort of did a, an independent study in the fall, looking at all the texts that we might um, put together, and then uh, did it in the spring with uh, Clara serving as uh, Wendy's um, assistant and Benjamin uh, being the, the uh, student teacher in my own course. And it looks, it's a contemplative studies class. So mm. it looks at all the ways in which activism um, is supported by contemplative practice. Um, we use a lot of podcasts. We use a lot of um, multimedia um, resources. We look across the range of religious traditions. Um, lots of um, good input around, across a, a, a wide um, diversity of perspectives around uh, what constitutes activism. Um, and then we have students and we ourselves, the teachers, um, try out these practices, whether it's journaling or mindfulness or poetry exchange, um, while we're going through the course and then um, sort of sharing our reactions and, uh, to those particular practices. Oh, wow. It's, it's very fun. Yeah, that sounds really, really neat, the way that the different, you know, the kind of different approaches all weave together. Mm -hmm. So those are my three faves. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, how about we switch gear and, and talk about um, your role as chaplain and, and what some of those responsibilities look like in a, in a typical academic year? Sure. Um, I am never bored. Um, <laughs> never. I went to seminary uh, in the last century wanting to be a chaplain, and it took me about 25 years to get there. And so none of that was wasted. All those vocational meanders were really important. I wouldn't have missed them for anything, and they inform everything I do. Um, so about half of my time is teaching, but, and about all of my time is chaplainy. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I've I've had roles like that before. Yeah, you know what that is like. <laughs> student affairs, yes. Um, so uh, a lot of it is sitting and listening to students and staff and faculty who are um, willing and wanting to share their lives with me and to help to ask for help in tapping into their own wisdom about um, what they might need for themselves or what they might need to be thinking about to make the next steps in their lives. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a clinician, so I am pretty good at listening and helping people discern what their values are and how they can make the choices that are in alignment with those. Mm -hmm. um, I serve on a lot of committees, um, <laughs> a lot of committees. Um, I, um, in at the beginning of the year and at various intervals during the year, you'll see me um, doing sort of um, public practice in the sense of um, invocations, meditations, um, all the things that um, mark uh, a public gathering as um, 
constituting something more than just a physical gathering of bodies in a space or of mm -hmm. minds in a space, that there is something larger going on here and there's a deeper purpose to it. Mm -hmm. um, the, my role as chaplain is to be here for people of all religious traditions and of no religious tradition. And so um, that piece of the work is fantastic. Um, and it, it, I've been in, in context um, where one religious, where one, the expectation was that you would be um, religious if you went to see the chaplain. And mm -hmm. that's not been the case at Willam, and I'm super grateful for that. And I think, but the, the um, spirit of inclusion that I try and include in all my um, public prayers and invocations and meditations for the faculty and any other thing that I'm asked to do, um, work before the board of trustees, um, is, is my sweet spot. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I came into this work um, and I identify as a Christian um, and I am constantly surprised at all the ways in which the Holy shows up uh, in the world. And um, I want to be open and curious about that. So uh, mm -hmm. this work allows that in, in amazing ways. So I listen, um, I help folks figure out what the right thing for them is. Mm -hmm. I do public prayer, um, serve on a lot of committees, do advocacy work. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes um, I've been around long enough that I kind of know who might be able to unpick a particularly tangled up knot. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's, that's the result of you know, 20 years of, of um, social capital, frankly. And right. the fact that it, it also doesn't hurt that I came onto campus under the enormous umbrella of credibility of my predecessor, Charlie mm -hmm. Wallace. Mm -hmm. And I showed up with a $2 million grant. That doesn't hurt either. Um, <laughs> That's a win. <laughs> yeah, right. All gone now, I have to say. It's all gone. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I see my, my work is always that of an educator. Um, and um, my work as a chaplain is to help people connect with spirit, however that shows up in their life, and mm -hmm. to deepen that relationship. So, um, And within those parameters, it's everything from... Um, I got to chair the first year experience task force. And so all the first years who, who hated some aspect of that, you come tell me about it. <laughs> um, but that, that was huge fun. Um, and I, along with a couple of other folks, I have this unique position of, of having one foot in the faculty world and one foot in the uh, administrative world. And mm -hmm. um, it allows some, some translation possibilities and opportunities that I really value. Awesome. I also relate, I, I relate to the larger Salem community. We gather a, a group of um, Salem faith leaders on a regular basis um, to talk about kind of what's going on and what the city needs. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an expansive role. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fantastic and, and awesome work that you do. And it's really important to our campus and we're fortunate to, to have you with us and especially for as long as you've, as you've, as you've been here. So thanks for everything that you do. Thanks. It's, it's uh, every once in a while I look up and I think, how did that happen that I've been here for almost 18 years? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. The time flies when you're having fun, as they say, right? Indeed. Indeed. So how, now that we're in the midst of this, this COVID-19 crisis, mm -hmm. how have those roles that you just described changed since, since um, March 16th? Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I was familiar with Zoom before, having used it for a number of contexts. I'm very familiar with the Zoom now. Um, so we've put lots of things online, um, and I've increased the programming for the chaplain's office. So um, they say convocations online. Um, we think it went pretty well last week. We're excited about this week, which is a campus community check-in, like how are we doing as mm -hmm. a community in this Kind of context. Um, I've uh, started offering morning prayer uh, with using the prayer book that um, Padre Gotuma wrote for the Corimila community. And you and I have had conversations about Corimila. Yeah, what um, a beautiful place in Northern Ireland. Um, and he's a poet. You sh we should insist that only poets write our prayers, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's, it's gorgeous prayer, and there are about 17 of us who um, pop in or out um, on any given weekday. And that's been the, um, the longest sort of sustained um, 
Christian prayer that um, I have experienced during my time here. And, wow. uh, but I just felt like there, and I usually don't show up in my own particular sectarian um, uh, role as, as a Christian minister, but I felt like this was an opportunity for that. And mm -hmm. not every, the, the, the readings each day following this prayer book are specifically from the gospels, but the prayers themselves are not specifically Christian. They're not Jesus-y. And so um, we've got folks who are spiritual, but not religious folks from other traditions sitting in as well. And uh, faculty, staff, students, alumni. Um, yeah. It's a really lovely gathering mm -hmm. at eight thirty every um, weekday morning. So that started. Um, I've been doing, uh, started a mindfulness meditation, a live one, um, for faculty and staff and students are welcome as well on Mondays mm -hmm. at 410, mm -hmm. doing a little um, loving kindness meditation and a little gratitude meditation. Um, and so that's a, a brief gathering uh, with video off so that nobody has to worry about what they look like when they're meditating. All right. Um, um, there's a coffee hour on Wednesdays at four o'clock. So bring your own beverage. Some things don't change. Uh, <laughs> right. We're not serving, uh, but it, it, we've done that once. And um, I think folks who would never have found themselves in the same room were in the same room. And so the possibilities there are pretty exciting. And I've been asked to do more mindfulness live stuff, which um, I'm trying to find the time in my schedule. I don't know if you're finding this, but the I am missing the the um, the grace of the um, in between the interstices mm -hmm. meetings where you get yes. to see a lot of people mm -hmm. and um, you get to connect, and that's not how this works now. And so mm -hmm. I'm being very intentional about reaching out. Um, I described it to somebody who's pastorally aggressive. I think that's a bit much, but um, <laughs> I'm. I would never go into somebody's residence hall and knock on their door, but I don't think twice about sending them an email saying, how's it going? <laughs> um, right. So I have space on my calendar um, and lots of, of meetings set up. So um, mm -hmm. that's, um, that's a piece of this as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you're putting out a lot of different types of outreach and making sure folks know that there's still resources available and the campus is obviously still here and we are, more than willing, we want to connect and, and keep our community together and, and interactive during this time. What kinds of things, as you put all that energy out, what kinds of things has, have kind of come back to you? You know, what are you sensing or seeing out there? Um, I am sensing that people want to gather. Mm -hmm. They want to get together. Um, there's a little Zoom fatigue. Yeah. Um, and I think we'll probably overcome that as we manage it. Um, mm -hmm. Faculty are working really hard to figure out how to teach well in this. Um, right. And they're really focused on what the students are experiencing in the classroom. Students may not know that. that um, and so that's one of the things we hope to sort of explore a little bit this, uh, at this convocation. That I was part of this amazing uh, conversation on Friday of faculty who were trying to figure out how to, how to teach really well and connect really well. Um, Mm -hmm. in, in this totally new, for most of us, environment. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of effort, a lot of um, goodwill. I'm seeing some Zoom fatigue. I'm seeing some, um, a little uh, drop off in energy mm -hmm. um, and a little weariness as it starts to hit that this may not be a short term kind of experience for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so trying to, to figure out ways that, that we can shift from a sprint to what may look more like a marathon mm -hmm. um, and how we sustain ourselves in that. So thinking right. about that. Um, my colleague Gary and I gathered a, a group as we do every year to plan baccalaureate um, for commencement weekend, the sort of interfaith um, gathering to reflect on what's uh, the last three or four years been like for some five years. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the sort of palpable grief in the senior class around how this isn't anything like what they were gonna, they thought they were gonna experience. Mm -hmm. um, that has been a really wonderful space in which to talk about what's going on for seniors with this group of amazing young folks. Um, mm -hmm. And they have sort of 
shifted and they're going to do, they're, they're sending out, um, or I'm sending out and they're sending out um, a call for submissions for um, a baccalaureate video. Wow. Right. So um, with the theme of networks of resilience, who has helped you um, during your time at, at Willamette? How has that um, uh, made a difference for you? All of those questions. So um, poetry, music, spoken word, um, shout outs to folks who have been part of that. So um, that video will be um, a kind of a lasting um, testament to, to the network of resilience that, that these students have experienced. So, so the grief of, of seniors, um, the anxiety or the uncertainty that we're all experienced about, it's like how long, um, we are not yet to the point of wanting the coolest mask, but that'll happen, right? Um, and uh, try to figure out how we hold together um, in mm -hmm. the short term and the long term. So um, it's interesting, we're, we're coming into, in, in my role as chaplain, I'm, I'm cognizant that we're coming into a time of um, religious holidays where folks usually gather, right? Um, this is Holy Week, um, Good Friday, Easter's on Sunday, um, Pesach, Passover starts uh, this evening. Oh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so ordinarily the sorrow for our Jewish students is they can't be home for Seder, right? Well, they're home for Seder, many <laughs> of them, not mm -hmm. all of them. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but um, you might not be able to get everything you need for your, your Seder. So that piece is happening. Um, and um, my neighbor's having a virtual Seder, right? Um, and then Ramadan starts uh, in a few weeks as well. And so um, the, our Muslim students who are home will be able to um, fast and break fast with their families, which is something they haven't been able to do during times when Ramadan has um, coincided with the school year. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we have never done this in, in our living memory in a, in a dispersal like this. Mm -hmm. So um, it'll be interesting to, I'm, my mind is on how to sustain the, the um, student religious groups as well during this time. Because mm -hmm. it's it flipped, right? Usually they're, we're longing for our families and now we're like maybe longing for each other. Yeah, longing yeah. for each other, longing for the physical campus, yeah. realizing in a lot of ways how special Willamette really is. And, um, you know, that's maybe a, a nice segue into my next question in terms of the amazing community that's, you know, in some ways being tested, but then also demonstrating itself to be strong and resilient. You know, what are some of the things about Willamette, you know, as you've seen, and maybe the transformation it has for students, as you've seen so many, you know, come through and become alumni, um, you know, maybe just a couple of observations about the campus and, and what makes it so special. Um, I have to go back to the touchstone of the motto, right? In the extraordinary ways um, through work with um, public health organizations, through work with um, uh, public benefit organizations, what some folks call nonprofits, um, with um, their careers. Um, I love looking at um, what alumni are doing because they are really. Um, embodying and deepening what we know happens with our students already, which is that they care deeply about the world and they want to find their place in it and they want to find the ways in which the gifts that they bring can be um, deepened and shared with the world. And so um, there is something about Willamette that um, actualizes in people working for the greater good, which um, was not always the case in places where I went to school goal, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly, yeah, but um, not always. And during the time that um, I was uh, directing the Lilly Project, which was all about vocation, right? Who, are, who am I? Why am I here? And what does the world need from me? What's my purpose? Um, it was always clear that um, we were hoping that students would figure out how to do good and do well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is what they do and it's just amazing and um 
they're making music and they are um, physicians and they are um, librarians teaching folks how to love reading and they're professors and they're elementary school teachers and clinicians and um, and builders and makers and um, and bakers they're 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 adding they're adding um, so mm. much to the world that um, and it, it really it, maybe I'm reading it back in but I have to think that at some point all these folks have said well unto whom or what am I born right mm -hmm. um, and watching the, the one of the huge benefits of having been in one place for so long is I get to see um, the lives of graduates and alums and it's just stunning it's stunning well said well said thanks for sharing that um and speaking of willamette and and you know what makes it amazing um you know it, we we change and we evolve and one of the big kind of evolutionary steps that's happening these days is the addition of claremont school of theology and so um, i think you're pretty well positioned to talk a little bit about how that's been and if you have any updates to share and and how exciting that is for our campus it's it's super exciting so the during the time it was all secret i'm not secret but we didn't know if it was gonna even gel enough to talk about it mm -hmm. uh, i was like okay could be neutral could it be neutral and i kept, sort of kept that neutral stance and one colleague finally came up to me and said so I trust you. How do you feel about this? And I just started jumping up and down. I said, it would be really difficult <laughs> to overestimate how excited I am about this. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> very difficult. Um, so I switched immediately into cheerleader mode, and now I, I haven't gone back to the, yes, it would be a really interesting uh, project. Um, <laughs> theological education is amazing, and Claremont, as a, as a graduate theological institution, is amazing. Um, they're, they're, they're high flyers. They're in the firmament of theological education. And mm -hmm. for Willamette to get to partner with them um, is an amazing opportunity um, to have a progressive, an institution with a progressive theological voice in the Pacific Northwest, which doesn't have that voice currently in an institutional form in, in, a, in a strong way, um, mm -hmm. is super exciting. Um, that there is an alternative to um, extremely conservative theological Christianity or theologically mm -hmm. conservative Christianity or secularism, that there is something in between there and that they are a multi-faith institution and deeply committed to uh, multi-faith education is um, just fantastic. Um, I'm running out of adjectives. Um, so <laughs> what it means for Willamette is um, we get to become um, uh, partners and um, eventually, um, once all the sort of staged um, connections institutionally happen, um, we get to, to be part of um, an institution on the forefront of progressive theological education. We get to um, have colleagues who are making connections between science and religion in really interesting ways that honor and um, support science and recognize religion as an important force in the world. Um, we get to pair with um, thinkers who are thinking about ways in which um, our current context, which people are less and less religious, but still need care, what that looks like. Spoiler alert, it looks like chaplaincy. Um, <laughs> and um, we get to, to um, deepen our thinking about all the reasons we, we do things and we're um, what I loved about the Lily Project was that it, it um, elevated the question of purpose and meaning. Mm. And I think having a, a theological institution bring um, programs in counseling, they'll bring um, law are mature and can do some um, mentoring and modeling for undergraduate students and for the rest of us. Um, as you know, we've had the first cohort of um, a very small group of um, residential Master of Divinity students and the hybrid and the intensive. Um, classes have been happening here. Uh, just an aside, the, one of the amazing resources that CST brings is they have been doing online teaching for a very long time and they are really good at it and they are mentoring our faculty in that. So we have an extraordinary resource there. That's great. Um, 
starting next fall, um, the expectation is that Claremont will be fully in Salem. And so um, we've had some faculty um, here this year um, uh, at teaching classes, and we have a number of students who are um, being taught, undergraduate uh, students are being taught by Claremont faculty. Um, they're being an amazing resource. And, um, but the expectation is that starting in the fall, um, we will all be together. So, mm -hmm. um, and they won't be splitting their time between Southern California and here. So one of the um, deep sadnesses, I think, for Claremont that I want to acknowledge is that um, their last commencement on their mm. campus, their historic campus, mm -hmm. um, will not be happening right. uh, during commencement time. And so yeah. in the that's, midst of that's them, so sad. It, it, this transition for them is um, an amazing opportunity and it comes with grief because there's mm -hmm. loss of, of the buildings and the place and, and uprooting of lives. Um, it's a great opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it may be, uh, it has to be bittersweet for them as well. So, sure. um, but so we, we will see if we are all together in the fall, we will all be together and that will be extraordinary. So that will be exciting. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing about that and the, and the updates and, um, I guess as we start to wind down, uh, you know, it's, it's always fun to drop in a fun fact or two. And uh, as, as we mentioned in your introduction, you are an avid backpacker. And maybe talk a little bit about that and then share, uh, you know, one of your more recent favorite little backpacking trips. Well, and actually, I shouldn't say little because you have been on some epic backpacking trips, if I remember correctly. Yeah, true, true. Um, uh, sadly, I could talk about the one I didn't get to take, which was over spring break, but um, it was to Grand Canyon, which is uh, my husband Rob's and my favorite place to go backpacking. So we try and go a couple times a year. Um, it's um, kind of the opposite of mountain climbing. You have your heaviest pack and you're descending. Um, so that day, and you have a lot of water with you because it's a desert environment. So that day can be a little rough, but um, love going to Grand Canyon. Um, so the two places, um, for wilderness that we like best or Grand Canyon or the Sierra, um, something about the granite in, uh, in the Sierra and done the John Muir trail and uh, some interesting loops through the Sierra Nevada as well. Um, we've been doing long walks in Scotland as well, wow. um, which, um, sometimes are backpacking with, with tent. Um, the Scottish, um, uh, access laws say you can camp anywhere. Oh my gosh. Anywhere. Um, the laws of physics and camping say you can camp anywhere that's flat and dry. So some places anywhere isn't really very much of anywhere. Um, <laughs> so um, sometimes wild camping, as it's called in Scotland, is, is um, a little more uh, possible and accessible than other times. Uh, sometimes you're looking for this tiny flat place that's not um, a bog. So... Um, but if anyone, um, so well over 20 years below the rim in Grand Canyon, and I'm happy to talk with anybody about backpacking there. It is, um, it is divine. It is excellent. It is fabulous. Um, an unbelievable landscape. It's great. Yeah. 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 I've, I've had the good fortune of, of going down, I guess what they call it rim to rim where you go down, cr hike across the bottom and come back up the top. That's the, the only time I've done all the way to the bottom, I've been back a couple times just to do, you know, like little day hikes halfway down and back up. But um, what an unbelievable experience. And, and I agree with it, it. There's no real words to describe how awesome it is. And no matter what I think what the buildup is that we could say about the Grand Canyon, it, it will still blow people's minds and, and exceed their expectations, I would, I would say. <laughs> it, it never gets old, which means... And a nice way of saying we're junkies, but it never gets old. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, and that's, that's cool to hear, too, that if you've been back that many times, then it's still just as phenomenal. Just as phenomenal. That's yeah. wonderful. Kind of like Willamette. No matter how many times yeah. you go back, it's just as phenomenal. It is. It is. Just sometimes they're ducklings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ducklings are starting to come. They're starting to, to hatch. Uh -huh. I just saw a post from, uh, from David Craig about that. Uh, we can count on Professor Craig to tell us what's going on with the ducklings. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. 
Hopefully we'll have an interview with him coming uh, in, the, in the near future. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. Well, hey, Karen, I think uh, this is a good, good stopping place. And uh, I just want to thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation today and I appreciate you sharing your time. Eric, it was great fun to hang out with you. And um, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I can't wait for, uh, for the Willamette community to get to spend some time with you in this, in this way. <laughs> All right, and speaking of the Willamette community, uh, I also want to thank our viewers. And if you enjoyed this presentation, please stay tuned as we'll be adding new content weekly. And please share your feedback with us and send suggestions for additional content to alumni at willamette.edu. All right, thanks again, Karen. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. And I hope to see you in person soon. That would be great. Thanks so much, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you.